the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A present Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune, and Mr. Victor Rizel of the New York Daily Mirror. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Christian A. Herter, United States Congressman from Massachusetts. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Congressman Herter, our audience knows of you as a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and as a leading Republican in Congress. Uh, I wonder if you'd speak to us, sir, tonight a bit about the foreign affairs of our nation. I think perhaps the most pressing foreign problem, or perhaps the most talked of foreign problem, is whether or not General Eisenhower will run for president, as a Republican, of course. Well, there, obviously, I've got to express my own opinion. I happen to be very enthusiastic for General Eisenhower as a candidate for the, on the Republican ticket. And my feelings about the general can very briefly be explained by the fact that I think he's got a concept of the importance of our foreign relations today that is unequaled by many people in public life. And I have the very deep conviction that our foreign relations condition almost everything that happens in our domestic affairs. Okay. In other words, that today, our the conduct of our foreign affairs is the most important factor in our domestic life. Well, Congressman, you say the general has concepts. Well, he has been asked by virtually everybody what those concepts are. Uh, if he's not declaring, at least, can you tell us what he stands for on, on foreign problems and on domestic problems? If he becomes president, he has to run this country. What does General Eisenhower stand for? Well, Mr. Rizal, there, obviously, I'm in the same position as any other private citizen. I can quote his published works. I could tell you that I've talked to him as an individual and convinced myself but he's got an extraordinarily clear picture of where our role in this world is conditioned by the relationships with other, other countries. Nobody can speak for him. He's going to have to speak for himself. When will that be, Congressman? Well, I'm convinced that it will come fairly soon after the Lisbon Conference that comes early in February. But that is the time where he has got to make at least his last appearance as a commander-in-chief in Europe. Now, I'm, again, speaking without authority, I'm guessing, but I think it will come very soon after Is that. there any political significance in the United States, any political events which might uh, hasten his decision in declaring himself? Well, there are a number of things that are happening automatically in our political life. The New Hampshire primaries come on the 10th of March. Under the New Hampshire law, at the end of January, the 29th of January to be exact, the Secretary of State of New Hampshire has got to notify any potential candidate whose name may go on the ballot, and Eisenhower will certainly go on the ballot in New Hampshire, that he has 10 days in which to withdraw his name from the ballot if he sees fit to do so. But don't the Democrats have the same prerogative? They have the same prerogative, and I think at that stage of the game, the general has got to make up his mind whether he's willing to have his name go on the Republican ballot and whether he's willing to have it taken off the Democratic Either ballot. or, huh? Well, Congressman, there's been uh, a great deal of conjecture, and obviously you're convinced he's going to stand for the presidency of the United States if he can get the Republican nomination. Do you think he can get the nomination if he declares? Yes, I do. I think he's been handicapped. I think he's been handicapped by factors that are entirely outside of his own control. And one of them that I'm rather bitterly critical of that I'd like to talk about 
is the slowness with which our own productive capacity in this country has been turning out armaments that could be used in the setting up of the European army. How does this affect the general? It affected very much because the whole time schedule on which he was supposed to operate from the point of view of a unified command on the arming of the minimum number of divisions has been set way back by our own slowness. Could producing. we have hastened that? Is, hasn't this time lag been due to tooling up? The time lag has not been due to tooling up. The time lag, that is an excuse that is given. But I think you'll find when you analyze the picture that the time lag has been due to perfectionists in the military establishment who've not been satisfied with any given tank, any given plane, any given gun. They've always wanted to make a better one, and so they've never given firm orders to turn out something which could be sent to Europe or sent to Indochina, or for that matter, Do sent to Korea. Do the Russians force our hand on this? Do the Russians keep producing better tanks, guns, planes? They do planes, certainly. Well, they keep producing them. What we have been doing, unfortunately, has been diddling a good deal with the perfectionist designs that we wanted to turn out well, ourselves. Well, and blueprints. And for that reason, I think we're at least 10 months to a year behind what we should have been from the point of view of the appropriation that Congress made. Well, Congressman Herder, then you think that the uh, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a failure, uh, oh, no. don't you? No. You say it has no armament? Not by a long shot. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization had a long way to go. When you're putting together the armed forces of a great many different nations under a unified command, you've got a tremendous number of problems dealing with national pride, national sovereignty, the pay schedules of the different non-commissioned officers, the officers, and everything that is connected with making a unified whole of a conglomerate mass of different nationalities. Well, that brings up the point That's of Mr. Churchill. Way. Mr. Churchill says that he will uh, throw in with us in NATO if we keep Mr. Or General Eisenhower at the command of the European operation, uh, which sort of puts Mr. Churchill in the role of supporting TAP. No, it doesn't. It keeps Britain out if the general declares. Is he going to declare or is he going to stay and Mr. Churchill will come in if he goes out? Well, I think, I think you're dealing now with what has been termed in days gone by as an iffy question. Well, I don't think that, that uh, those two things are definitely related. In other words, I think that General Eisenhower can get this picture in such shape that he can very properly retire and let a competent successor carry on. Uh, and you you'll talk about the, about the individual that is the... Uh, sine qua non of an effective organization I don't believe in. But, Congressman, that's not an iffy question. Uh, the Prime Minister of the British Empire, Winston Churchill, is a very determined man. He says he doesn't go in if the general goes out. Now, uh, the general may declare, but what happens to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization if England doesn't come through? Well, you're a better judge of the timing of a news story than I am. Thank you, sir. On the other hand, Churchill's statement was made two days ago, and then it was followed by a very succinct statement as to his attitude toward the, the armament problem in Europe and the relationship of a unified Europe. And I have a feeling that his second statement completely overshadowed the first, and that the first, dealing with the inevitability of Eisenhower remaining in the picture, has now been superseded. May I ask this? Uh, if the general runs, I don't think this question has ever yet been asked, uh, who will he run with? Uh, you're high in the Republican ranks. Your booming Eisenhower for president. Have you people considered a running mate for General Eisenhower? No, and I don't think that that is something that needs to be considered at this moment. The convention time is still six months away. Uh, frankly, my, co my primary consideration is getting Eisenhower nominated in the first instance. You have some doubt of that? Well, I've got doubt about that because you've got certain factors today that are working against Eisenhower in the picture, and let's not minimize them. Which of those, sir? Well, today, with these scandals that are developing, day after day, that are undermining people's faith in the administration's ability to carry on an honest administration in the tax department, in a lot of various departments, the post office department, other departments of the government, there is a growing conviction that the Republicans can win with any ticket whatsoever. A dangerous supposition, isn't it? I mean, for the Republicans. Well, from my point of view, it is. Yeah. I think we've been deluded by that same 
illusion, if you want to call it that, before. Yeah. I don't I don't want to see us do it again. And by any candidate, you mean Senator Taft? Well, I mean Senator Taft. I'm, I'm not minimizing Senator Taft as an individual. I've been a personal friend of his for 30 years. But Senator Taft is a fine individual who, from the point of view of the ordinary rules of the game, would be entitled to the nomination for his contribution to the party. Do you think he can win, sir? If not... My principal reason for feeling so strongly about Eisenhower as a very able and competent person is that I think that he can win and that he has a very much better chance of winning and I think that's terribly important from the point of view of the future of this country. Well, Congressman Herter, we certainly appreciate you coming with us. <clears throat> you have enlightened us a good deal about General Eisenhower's chances and his campaign. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Donald I. Rogers and Mr. Victor Rizel. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Christian A. Herter, United States Congressman from Massachusetts. The worldwide prestige of Longines watches is proof of their unsurpassed dependability and accuracy. These qualities are the result of the extraordinary excellence in the design and the manufacture of the Longines watch movement, the beating heart of every Longines watch. Here is the matured product of the skill and experience acquired through 85 years of watchmaking. The ultra-slow motion camera reveals the smooth, flawless mechanism of the Longines balance assembly, the guardian of the accuracy of the watch. Through his magnifying glass, the skilled watchmaker sees, in addition, the precious hand finishing of essential parts, which makes the Longines watch so superior, so outstanding. Yes, there are tangible reasons why Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. When next you buy a watch, for yourself or as a gift, remember, if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines, and you should insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight again reminding you that the Longines Chronoscope is brought to you three times weekly, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So won't you join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.